Hello and welcome to chapter 17. Uh, this chapter has taken me quite a while to put together and I've had difficulties finding the time to sit down and record the whole thing. So I apologize that I didn't get this to you yesterday. But uh, here we go. I'm going to try to move along pretty quickly because it's a big chapter. And the more I got into it, the more I wanted to say. Um, hopefully this is a good setting. I'm in the backyard of my aunt's house in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we are talking about electricity and magnetism today, uh, which are two topics tied into one. Uh, this is the electromagnetic force. And I got to thinking about it, it's like this is one of the four fundamental forces of nature under the, uh, the fundamental theorem that physicists use, which is what they currently use. Back in um, Newton's time, he was aware of electromagnetism and gravity, so there were two forces. And now we know that there's more than gravity and electromagnetism. We have a strong nuclear force, which holds the nucleus of, the, of each atom together, because you think about how, how do those protons and neutrons stay together. And the weak nuclear force, which is involved in radioactive decay, um, and it's the reason that the center of our Earth is molten hot, uh, the, that there's radioactive decay occurring beneath our feet, you know, in the, in the center of the Earth there. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, that's a pretty good force. Uh, responsible for volcanic activity and earthquakes and things like that pretty cool um, and keeping the planet's interior hot and melted and the turning of that molten iron actually is responsible for the fact that the earth is a giant magnet so that's the weak nuclear force um, radioactive decay involved in that I can't say anything more because I don't know too much about it um, the Electromagnetic force is what we're talking about today, and it's part, I mean, light gets involved in this because light's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, TV, radio waves, um, the electricity, the society as we know is pretty dependent on the electromagnetic force. Um, of these four fundamental forces of nature, gravity is actually the weakest of the force, of the forces. Um, but on a large scale, it has quite an impact, like on the scale of planets and, and us sticking to planets and things like that, so we're not thrown off into space at a thousand miles an hour. Um, the electromagnetic force is stronger than gravity. The weak nuclear force is stronger than the electromagnetic force, but it's working at very small subatomic distances, and then the strong nuclear force is even stronger still. Uh, physicists are still trying to find a way to tie all of these together into a grand unified theory, if they could find a, a fundamental particle for gravity, um, or a, a theory of everything, uh, possibly tie, tie them all together. Um, let's see if I can get this. I want to click on that link, and it's not letting me. Come on. Copy the hyperlink. You have to do it the hard way. No, didn't even copy the link for me. Copy hyperlink. Paste. No. Four forces of nature. Videos. Okay, I didn't even get my little clip of what I wanted. And the duck's flying overhead. I don't know if you could hear that. Brian Cox is the physicist that I want. And I just want a loop. There's a, there's a loop. There we go. Um, we're just going to listen to that one more time. Oh. 
particles of matter, over forces of nature. 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature. It's a wonderful and significant story. Yay! So, you get to talk with your kids about this wonderful and significant story of four forces of nature, and electromagnetism is one of these four fundamental forces, which is pretty cool. Um, so, the fundamental theory again includes the strong nuclear force that binds the nucleus, the weak nuclear force which is involved in radioactive decay, and now there's mowing, I apologize for the background noises, um, electromagnetic force binding atoms together and involved in light and magnetism and electricity and all these things we're talking about today, and the gravitational force binding the solar systems and all that sort of thing. Okay, on to electricity, I, it, we could start anywhere, we could start with magnets, we could start with electricity, we could start they're, they're all related, but we're going to start with static electricity. Static means that they're not moving, so think of a whole bunch of cars in a parking lot. They are static. They're just there. Um, if these cars were electrons, there's a buildup of cars in this parking lot. Static electricity, there's a buildup of electrons um, or a buildup of charges between two things. Uh, so when you have a bunch of positively charged things over here and a bunch of negatively charged things over there, you have static electricity. Electric current is when the electrons are flowing, okay, and usually in a controlled fashion through wires, um, throwing, flowing through a circuit in your house, but lightning is electric current, uh, shocking yourself when you touch a doorknob and you you got static electricity on you, uh, that's electric current when things are flowing. <laughs> so. Uh, how do we get static? It was usually friction. It's things touching each other that have different affinities for electrons. So some things are anxious to give up electrons, some things are anxious to take electrons, and so electrons will flow from one to the other and you'll get a difference. And once you get a difference and you, you have positively charged here and negatively charged there, then they attract each other, right? And so here's the hair being attracted to the plastic or the polyethylene beads being attracted to the cat who jumped into the box and was most unhappy about that. Um, so a quick review of the atom is just that we have the nucleus with our protons and neutrons and we have the electrons buzzing around them. And remember from the football field example, these electrons are actually quite far from the nucleus. The atom is mostly empty space. They're also teeny tiny and they're traveling at the speed of light. So they could go around the earth 70 times in a second. Um, so, electrons do weird things, uh, and, and with those weird things they create magnetism and electricity, and, and um, so when they build up, when a bunch of electrons build up on one surface compared to another surface, you have static electricity. So the, uh, oftentimes we rub like a, you know, rub a balloon against your hair, and you'll transfer electrons from one material to another because the two materials, your hair and the balloon, have different affinities for the electrons. One of them likes electrons more than the other. And so they will go from the, the place that has less affinity, you know, likes them less, to the place with more affinity and create that electrostatic charge. Um, so basically, the things higher on the list will give up electrons to the things lower on the list. So the, the further down the list you go, the more these things like electrons and take them. So your hair compared to uh, the balloon, which I don't know, someplace in, in here, um, you know, the balloon wants the electrons more. It takes them off of your hair. And so, or the, you know, the, the, the polyvinyl chloride plastic, uh, PVC, I mean, the, 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 the girl in the slide, you know, that was a plastic slide. And so as she went down the slide, it wasn't just coming off of her hair, her whole body was losing electrons. And so she was becoming positively charged and the slide was becoming negatively charged. And the result was that her hair was sticking up. Um, and here, the balloon, you know, you rub the balloon on the head, the balloon is becoming negatively charged, the hair positively charged. And the nice thing about this too, once you build up static on that balloon, uh, you can discharge it by touching it against something metal that will grant, you know, let the electrons flow into the ground. Um, but you can keep the charge on there. You can stick the balloon to the wall, 
uh, you could have little bits of paper and the bits of paper are neutrally charged but you can hold the balloon over the paper and it will suck up the paper um, that's called an induced charge and I don't think I put in a slide about an induced charge but the the bits of paper that, that don't have a charge to them they're just little bits of paper sitting on the table uh, they're neutrally charged but just holding this negatively charged balloon near them causes the positive causes the paper to become a little bit charged uh, causes its electrons to to be repelled by the balloon because the negative charge repels the negative charge so all the electrons run to one side of the paper leaving the other side of the paper positively charged so whoop, the, the positively charge it sucks up next to the balloon um, so you can induce a charge something that's charged when brought near something else will cause that other thing to become charged um, so that's uh, inducing a charge okay um, so this doesn't work well on a humid day. Uh, these experiments work best in winter time, where when the air tends to be drier. Uh, winter, the cooler air tends to be drier. I don't know how it is in Del Rio, but you want a dry day if you want static electricity. And if you live in a cold climate, uh, the winter time, you, you walk around the you know in your socks on the carpet, you're going to build up a static charge. Um, you can use what's called a Van de Graaff generator. You can buy one of these Van de Graaff generators. They can be kind of expensive, but you know it's just got a rubber belt in it, and it's basically just rubbing and transferring electrons onto this insulated metal sphere, or, or, or stripping them off of it. And um, and anyway, the the sphere gets charged. Now this girl is standing on a rubber mat. She has to be insulated. She can't be grounded, so she has to be standing on a rubber mat. And again, this has to be kind of a dry day, but but uh, obviously she's built up quite a charge of static electricity there. You can buy very inexpensively what's called the fun fly stick. Fun, like, gee, this is fun, fly, because it flies around or makes things fly around. Stick, because uh, it's like a little wand. And the fun fly stick is a miniature Van de Graaff generator. It generates static electricity, and they have, it, it's not metal, it's uh, um, mylar, like a mylar balloon, and uh, these things will be repelled and float around and you can do tricks with them. And Anyway, so look up a video of Fun Fly Stick or uh, just go buy one for your class and endless amusement there. Okay, materials remain charged until they have an opportunity to discharge. So again, with the balloon, it will mean, you know, it will hold that charge, you can stick it against the wall it will leak, you know, it won't stay on the wall forever, it will lose its charge over time, it will discharge, but if you put it against something metal that's grounded, uh, it will discharge very quickly, or if you're rubbing your feet on the carpet and you go near the doorknob and, you know, the, you'll get a little zap as the charge jumps across. So that little jumping across is an electric current, you know, now it's, now it's flowing across. Um, you have to be careful filling your gas tank. You know, you, you, you want to, to be grounded. You don't want static building up uh, there. Old gasoline trucks, uh, their anti-static device, they didn't want charge building up as they drove down the freeway. Uh, they just had chains dragging beneath the, um, beneath the truck, and it would be dragging along and sparking, uh, but, you know, it was in contact with the ground, and, and continuously electrons could flow in, into the ground that were building up on the, on the truck. Newer ones have a have a different system for preventing uh, static buildup. Um, so unlike charges attract each other, so positives attract the negatives. Like charges repel each other, negative charges repel other negative charges. Uh, oh, here's this little slide about induction, and I was talking about induction with the paper. Um, so negatively charged rubber balloon, small bits of paper will stick to the balloon. Um, even though they were neutrally charged, they'll develop a positive charge uh, in response to the negative charge of the balloon. Okay, and but with a you could have glass and rub the glass a glass rod with um, with a piece of rabbit fur, and the glass rod is now positively charged as opposed to the negatively charged balloon. You can go to those same bits of paper and they'll stick to the glass rod, so they will have they will. The, the glass rod will induce a, a negative charge 
in the paper, whereas before they had a positive charge. So again, you can you can induce a charge um, just by being charged. So if you have something that's negatively charged, it will induce the other thing to be positive, or if you have something positively charged, it will induce a negative charge in, in the other object. Okay, um, so here we go. Here's, here's the rod that's negatively charged. Uh, here's the paper. Uh, the negative charges on the rod basically repelled the negatively charges on the paper. Negative charges on the paper. So before these positive and negatives were just scattered throughout evenly, the paper was neutral. But because uh, the rod was brought near to it, the negative charges were pushed away. The positive charges were brought to one end, and there's an attraction. The little paper goes whoop, and jumps up to it, sticks to it. Okay, so there's just a slide saying what we were just talking about. And so, you know, the positively charged object brought near the neutral object, the negative electrons move towards the surface, blah, 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 blah. You can, I'll, I'll try to post this revised PowerPoint so you can go through on your own and look at the details if you want. Okay. Um, lightning is a discharge of static electricity. So as the clouds rub past each other, uh, they build up static electricity. Within clouds, uh, the charges are not equally distributed. And usually this happens when warm air and cold air are moving past each other. Um, and you get these air currents and you get you get charges built up within the cloud. And so you can have lightning that is within the cloud because different parts of the cloud have charges and, the, and they can discharge between them. Or you can have lightning that happens between the cloud and the ground. So it can be within a cloud, it can be between clouds. You know, you've seen lightning go sideways across the sky between clouds. Uh, so within cloud, between clouds, or cloud to ground. And of course the cloud to ground is the one that, that uh, we care about most and that gets our attention. Um, and lightning follows this curved path. It's basically electricity always takes the easiest pathway and it finds it very quickly. Um, and usually it's just a question of, of um, where's there the most water in the air or just, I don't know, the right charges. And it just sneaks down there very quickly. Uh, and of course, if there's something metal uh, poking up a radio tower or something, you know, some lightning rod, it's more likely to, to go to that point than to another point. So lightning is a sudden electrostatic discharge during the electrical storm between electrically charged regions of a cloud. Sorry about the mowing lawn. I wish I could just turn it off. Um, yeah. Okay, so the cloud to ground lightning is the one we care about most. Interesting facts about lightning. 40 to 50 flashes of lightning every second of every day, if you look at the whole global scale. And so it's mostly occurring when warm air is mixing with colder air. The science of lightning is called fulminology. A person can be a fulminologist and study lightning. Fear of lightning is called astrophobia. Maybe you know somebody who has astrophobia. And the place that has the most lightning in the world is a village, a mountain village in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. They get about 400 lightning strikes per square mile every year. So more than any other place on Earth. And lightning itself is a plasma. And I talked about different states of matter, liquid, solid, gas. We mentioned plasma. I said, eh, you know, plasma is like in the sun. Well, plasma is also a lightning arc. Uh, and so the lightning itself is superheated to like 80,000 degrees. So, you know, that cooked your hamburger really quick. Um, thunder is a sonic boom because when you heat the air to 80,000 degrees, that's a super massively fast expansion of the gas. And so it, boom, it creates this sonic boom. And so everywhere the lightning goes, you know, it's creating this sonic boom. And you hear rolling thunder because you have multiple, you know, lightning branches out in all directions. And, and, and so you're, you're getting thunder, you're getting sonic booms coming from many places at once. So I think it's really cool that thunder is a sonic boom. Um, sound travels about 340 meters per second, um, as opposed to light, you know, 386 or 186,000 miles per second. So the, the, the light gets to you essentially instantaneously, 
but it takes a while for the thunder that for the sonic boom to get to you and they say you know count one two three i used to think it was you know a, a second for every mile no in a second the sound only goes 340 meters so about a kilometer every three seconds or about five seconds for a mile um so i used to think that oh you know five seconds oh it's still five miles away no it's a mile away uh three seconds it's a kilometer away. One second, it's almost on top of you. Um, and when you hear them both, you know, when you hear the thunder at the same time that the lightning's there, obviously, you're is right on top of you. Um, and it can be exciting and somewhat terrifying, you know, to have lightning strike very, very close to you. Um, okay, on to magnets. Attractive subject. Um, magnetism. Magnets are just great fun. You should buy magnets for your class. You can buy some really good, powerful magnets nowadays. You know, they have the, the traditional magnets, but you can also buy rare earth magnets for, for not very much money. Uh, do a search for rare earth magnets or molybdenum or neodymium magnets, and you can get some really cool stuff. And I don't, I didn't throw in the videos about magnets, but you should watch, you should search around for some you know, fun magnet videos or cool magnet videos because there's all sorts of cool stuff going on. Um, iron, nickel, cobalt, and steel are the well-known magnetic materials. Like I said, there's some molybdenum and neodymium, some rare earth elements that that also are part of mag that can be made into magnets. But within an atom, let me jump back to the uh, model of the atom very briefly here. I told you that we don't draw atoms correctly, and this is this is not a correctly drawn atom. Um, so maybe I won't even use that. But basically, electrons are distributed in a way that um, one electron is going to be spinning say clockwise and there will be another electron spinning counterclockwise and so th their spins are opposite they kind of cancel each other out uh, iron nickel cobalt steel uh, they're transitional <coughs> metals that that have an electron that doesn't have a partner and so that electron is just I think that's why they're magnetic I don't fully understand this but I think it's because they've got one electron that's just doing its thing without a partner doing the opposite thing. Um, that's part of it. Uh, the, the natural magnets are called lodestones. Um, they contain magnetite, a type of iron. Lodestones are magnets. Uh, they're natural magnets. And the word magnet comes from the region that they were found in Macedonia or Greece or something. Um, but they've been known since the time of Socrates and and you know, mysterious and fascinated people and and it wasn't known for a while that that the earth was a magnet or that you know you could get a needle to point north uh, that was pretty major discovery for you know navigation of the globe um, most of the just basic refrigerator magnets they're we could call them alnico combination of aluminum nickel and cobalt um, you often talk about magnets based on their shape, horseshoe magnets, rod magnets, disc magnets, bar magnets, um, and there are also electromagnets which you make with using electricity and we'll talk about those a little bit too. With magnets there's a north and the south pole and the opposite poles attract each other, the like poles repel each other and you can do some fun stuff with that. Uh, if you want to look up magnet gun uh, that's pretty cool. Um, if you want to get some, you can get little disc magnets with a hole through them, and if you have, uh, I don't know, like a little wire or a uh, stick or something that you can thread the magnets onto, if you put two of them, you know, the, so the one that has the North Pole up, one that has the North Pole down, you know, then they're, the, the top one's going to levitate, it's going to be repelled, uh, and it will just kind of be floating there in space. Like I said, lots of fun things you can do with with magnets. Um, uh, magnetism 
again it has to do with the the atoms and the electrons um, within the material atoms kind of arrange themselves into domains and or you know kind of clusters of atoms that are doing kind of the same thing together and the domains are usually just randomly arranged and so there's no magnetism to that substance if you can line up all the domains then the material is magnetic and um, so here's something with you know we'll call, say that it's a, a piece of iron or something and the domains are each kind of pointing different directions um, but if you can orient them together then ta-da you have a magnet um, so in the case of our earth the the molten interior the melted iron uh, swirling in one direction that's uh, it's it's the the lining up of things that creates the magnet um, effect so magnetic field magnetic lines of force they go out in all directions um, from the the poles and so we draw them you know a drawing is only two-dimensional but but really this is you know going around in three dimensions and the space occupied by these lines of force is called the magnetic field and when you get within the magnetic field you know any magnetic material is going to be attracted to the magnet now these magnetic fields technically go on forever but they go you know they, they get weaker very quickly so they they act the strongest at close distances um, our earth is one giant magnet and so the magnetic field of the earth actually extends thousands of miles out into space and you think okay well no big deal uh, who cares well a couple interesting things first uh, the North Pole is technically the South Pole of, uh, in terms of a magnet you know because our our needle that says North is attracted to the North Pole you know when you look at a compass the needle points north. Well, for it to point north, you know, for for the north part of the needle to be attracted to something, that has to be the south pole of the magnet, because the opposite poles attract. Um, so technically, the north pole, geographically, is the south pole magnetically. It's okay. We'll still just call it north. Um, another interesting thing is that that. Um, the rotational axis of the Earth and the magnetic axis are not the same thing. There's about a 10 degree difference there. Um, again, the, the Earth's geomagnetic field is due to the rotation of the molten iron at the core. Another interesting thing is that the Earth's magnet reverses polarity every several hundred thousand years. So several hundred thousand years ago, north was south, south was north. So the magnet just flips, essentially. And this leaves uh, signatures in rocks, you know, because iron, molten iron, gets oriented uh, in line with the magnetic fields of the Earth. So volcanic activity, any iron in it, the, the, the iron particles get aligned with the magnetic field. And so if you go back and look at uh, volcanic activity from several hundred thousand years ago, it was oriented the other direction. So this helps with... Um, this is actually uh, was used in discovering plate tectonics, uh, which we haven't talked about yet. But the the whole Earth's ma mantle, the crust, and how continents move around. Uh, learning this little tidbit about about the Earth's poles switching and how that left a, a signature in the rocks. It was pretty fundamental to that discovery. Um, and because it extends thousands of miles into space. Uh, it protects us against solar flares and solar winds and cosmic rays and without that protection our atmosphere would be stripped away all the ozone would be stripped away we get all this UV radiation um, so why does Earth have an atmosphere and Mars does not uh, in a large part because Earth is a magnet and Mars is not so Mars doesn't have the internal rotation of a melted iron core uh, it doesn't the, the planet is not a giant magnet so it once would have had an atmosphere of some sort not the same atmosphere but an atmosphere and it got stripped away because it didn't have the protection of a giant magnet so way to go earth isn't that cool um 
Now, where the North Pole is actually changes over time. Uh, it, you know, it changes quite a bit over in Canada, over in Greenland, over, you know, and it's not actually, there's the, there's the physical, geographical North Pole of the planet, and it hasn't been there uh, since the time that we've been observing it, since, the, you know, 1590. Um, but uh, you can see that it's been moving over time. So, so it's it's someplace over here. It's still moving, it moves all the time. Okay. So a compass consists of a small magnetic needle suspended in place, and it can freely rotate, and it's going to point north. Uh, again, the you know the part that points north is actually attracted to a south pole of a magnet. So, you know, it, the north pole of the Earth is technically a south pole magnetically. Um, now, of course, this only works if there's no other magnetic influence around. So you can't hold any other magnet near a compass or else it will be more attracted to that because it's close, you know, because, because it's stronger, uh, a stronger magnet at that distance. Um, an electrical current, we'll talk about how electrical currents produce magnets, so an electrical current can mess up a compass as well. Um, I don't have time to show you this video because I am trying to not be quite so long, but you should look up mind-blowing magic magnets or smarter everyday magnets. Just search for smarter everyday magnets because you should watch smarter everyday now and then anyway. It's a great YouTube channel. Um, but this is something crazy with magnets. They, they, they've got magnets that, that have multiple north and south poles on a single face. Uh, this is new technology and it's weird and and uh, you should watch the 10 minute video to see some of the applications they've come up with and there will be a lot more that they come up with in time. Uh, so I think that's going to be pretty cool. On to electric current or you know motion of electrons. So electric charge in motion, we talked about lightning, we talked about sparks on a doorknob, but we're going to talk about controlled flow of electricity through a wire. Now, uh, there, lots of metals are good conductors. Um, silver is a better conductor than copper, but which is cheaper? Copper. Uh, aluminum is okay, uh, but and aluminum is cheaper than copper, but they found that aluminum developed this film on the wire over time, and, uh, and it tended to cause house fires. So... Uh, for home electrical wiring, they require copper. Copper is a good conductor. It doesn't develop a film. Um, and you'll see around the copper uh, some plastic. You know, it's an insulator. So, uh, and there, there's more plastic. So these things don't conduct electricity. You know, plastic is an insulator. So you have a conductor surrounded by an insulator. It's all, all about trying to control uh, the flow of electricity in a safe manner. A battery is a chemical storage device uh, that can produce an electrical force. So um, batteries essentially have a negative and positive built within them, and there's an imbalance of charge between the two sides. And you know, if you imagine the charge, and over time, you know, here's this imbalance, and over time it evens out. Once it's evened out, that battery has no more ability to to give a charge unless you can. Uh, recharge it by by making up that difference again. Um, so here are some AA batteries. They are one and a half volts, which is a low voltage. So you can play with batteries without hurting yourself. Um, and don't play with high voltage, uh, you know, unless you know what you're doing because you could really hurt yourself. But batteries, low voltage, uh, not a problem. Uh, open circuit versus closed circuit or an incomplete versus complete. So you can get a little LED battery and play with the wires and basically, you know, if, uh, or sorry, a little LED light and a battery, and if you connect the two sides, then ta-da, you'll get the light on. So, I don't know, you, sh you should, you'll come across materials where you can build little circuits like this and play with it and it's, it's cheap to do. Um, and basically when the wire is touching, then it allows the electrons to flow from this negative 
over to the positive. And you don't want to just, you could put just a wire between the negative and positive end. You don't want to do that uh, because then that's a, the, the, the light limits the flow of electrons. The, the, they flow more slowly. If you have just the wire, if you left the light out of this and put just the wire, the electrons would flow very quickly. They wouldn't be accomplishing anything other than heating up the wire. And if it was like a 9-volt battery, the wire could get quite hot. You could burn yourself. Um, but it will just drain your battery quickly and do nothing. So, um, so you want to put something, some sort of resistor in there that resists the flow of electrons and does something interesting like makes a sound or turns a light on or something. Okay, we talked about uh, materials that allow electrons to flow easily through them. Um, gold is a fine conductor, but awfully expensive. Um, you know, different different things can be used for different applications, but most, you know, like home wiring is going to use copper. The insulators can be glass, rubber, wood, dry air, cloth, plastics. Um, old power poles with the glass insulators, some people collect them. Uh, you know, the, you're probably familiar, I didn't put in a picture of those glass insulators, but all through the West, it, you know, they have these old power lines and insulated, you know, the wires were held insulated in place uh, with glass. Um, now they have other types of insulators, ceramic, uh, that they use instead. Um, so again, to have a flow of electrons, you need to have a circuit that is complete. Uh, where you can go from the power source and back. Um, and so here's another example of a closed circuit, a uh, complete circuit. So you can put a switch in, and a switch just opens and closes the circuit. So, so here the example was just whether we touched both ends of the battery. You know, that was our switch. You know, that was how we completed the circuit, is we touched both ends of the battery. Here, We've got both ends of the battery, and we have a switch, a little gate of some sort. And so all a switch does when you flip on a light switch or whatever, it just completes a circuit. And so when the switch is closed, ta-da, the electrons can flow. And they're flowing from the negative side of the battery to the positive side of the battery. Um, okay, there's the closed circuit. Again, there's a reminder to not play with high voltage. Um, and at your home, you have 120 volts, which is plenty. Um, now, technically, the uh, that Van de Graaff generator with the poofy hair, the static electricity, uh, that girl was probably touching 150,000, 200,000 volts. Uh, so how could she survive that? Um, because of low amperage. So we're, I'm going to talk for just a moment a little bit between the relationship between volts and amps. Um, but let's just say don't play, don't stick things in sockets because it, you know, it can kill you. Uh, and high voltage transmission lines, this could be 500,000 volts. Uh, and these are not insulated, by the way. So um, very high voltages. And uh, I could explain why transmission lines would be at such high voltage uh, if we look at volts and amps and watts. So this is extra stuff, it's not going to be on your test, but if you think of it in terms of water flowing, this is just an analogy, it's not perfect, uh, but the volts are like the pressure in a hose and kind of how fast the water would be moving through it. The amps, the amperage, would be the size of the hose. So if you have high voltage but low amps, you know, that would be a very fine stream of water going quickly. You know, like a squirt gun could be pretty high voltage but low amps. Um, it's not going to hurt you. So the Van de Graaff generator could be high voltage but low amps. It's a squirt gun. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, high voltage, high amperage would be like a fire hose. You know, it's a wide hose with lots of pressure. Boom. Um, you don't want to mess with that. Um, the watts is essentially a combination of the amps and the voltage. It's telling you in our little analogy here how many gallons per minute are flowing through that hose. So you're going to get a lot more water coming through a fire hose than through a squirt gun. Oh, and, uh, and the garden hose is going to be someplace in between. 
you can look at your house and say, oh, there's a 60 watt bulb, there's a 60 watt bulb, and you could you could add up the wattage in your house and think, okay, so given the wattage and knowing that I have 120 volts at my house, what is the amperage? How many amps do I need to run, you know, all my light bulbs and my computer and stuff? So you can calculate that. Now you're going to need bigger and bigger wire to accommodate the amperage. Um, and so I'm going to explain why we use high voltage for transmission. We don't use higher than 120 volts in the home because we don't want certain death. You know, when a kid electric use. I, I twice shocked myself with 120 volts and I'm still here to tell the tale. So 120 volts isn't usually going to kill you. It can, but not usually. So that's the voltage that we chose for in the home. Uh, in Europe, it's 220 volts, so more dangerous, but it's still okay. But we certainly don't do 100,000 volts. Now, if we had 100,000 volts, we could use very skinny wires because, because high voltage, if, for the same number of watts, you could have a skinny wire or low amperage and high voltage if you had very high voltage. Anyway, but 120 volts with with the number of watts you need in the house, the, the wire doesn't have to be super thick. Now, you can't run your whole house off of one circuit or else you would need much thicker wire. So you divide it up into multiple circuits um, and each one can sustain a particular amount of wattage, a certain load. Um, anyway, for transmitting, you know, for taking from the generating plant to the city, we, you know, the city, the whole city is going to use millions of watts. And so, if you if you kept it at 120 volts, your wires would they would be enormous, right? The wires would be thickness of a bus. And obviously, you can't do that. You can't build copper wires the thickness of a bus and string them along on on poles. Um, so for transmission, we use really high voltage, and that lets us lower the amperage. And those high voltage wires, they're they're way up high uh, for two reasons. One, they don't want you to touch them, uh, certain death, you know, if you're if you, but they don't want them making lightning to the ground. <laughs> you know, the, the electricity will find a way. You know, if it can find a way to the ground, it will do that. Uh, instead, you know, it, it always wants to go to the ground if it can. Uh, so if you fly a kite and, you know, touch the high voltage wire, even though cotton string or whatever doesn't carry electricity very well, you, that's a pathway to the ground. It will zap you and kill you. Um, so anyway, they put those high voltage on tall towers uh, so it's not zapping the ground, so it's not jumping down to the ground. So it's pretty dangerous stuff. But that's how we decided to do um, transmission. You can learn more about it if you want to study alternating current versus direct current and why Edison and Nikola Tesla were at odds with each other and, and you know, Edison wanted direct current and Tesla wanted alternating current and why did Tesla win. It's a pretty interesting story. Um, and just, by the way, one amp, which is a low amperage, is 624 how many zeros is that billions and billions and billions of electrons per second so that's kind of weird but you know things are weird at the atomic level um, I just found that number and threw that in for the GWIS file uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 16 zeros anyway it's a really big number um, that's a lot of electrons flowing in a second so again it's all about electrons flowing between atoms and some things like metals, the electrons flow between the atoms very easily. Some things like plastics, they don't want electron, you know, they just don't allow electrons to flow between them. So they're, they are insulators. Um, back to our circuits. Here's an incomplete circuit or open circuit, and all we need to do is touch the wire to the other end of the battery, and and we'll have a complete circuit. Um, here is a circuit that's in series, and here's the switch, and it's closed, so, so this is a complete circuit, and it flows through three different bolts. So it, it's going to flow 
through bulb one, two, three, and back to the battery. And all three of them will light up. Uh, it's going to draw power. Each one will be not as bright. You know, to have three bulbs, they're they're not going to burn. They won't be as bright because they're there's a limited number of power coming from this battery, a limited amount, so they won't glow as brightly as if you just had one. But um, but the important thing here, in series, if one bulb burns out, you've broken the circuit, right? The power can't flow. Uh, if bulb two burns out, or it doesn't matter which one burns out, it doesn't matter, you've broken the circuit. It's like you've opened the switch. So it doesn't work. Uh, the whole thing you know, so one, one goes out, none of them work. And Christmas Christmas tree lights, uh, they do this all the time. Uh, they, they're they better about it now, but for years and years and years, they would wire Christmas tree uh, light bulbs in series so that when one light goes out, you're searching all over the, 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 the whole strand trying to replace the one bulb so that the, the whole strand will work again. Because the whole strand stops working if one bulb goes out. This was intentional on their part. They, had only, they just wanted you to buy Christmas lights every year. So they built them this way, which was stupid. Um, they should have wired them in parallel. This takes more um, more wire a little bit. So yeah, it's a little bit more expensive to make. But then if a bulb goes out, just that bulb doesn't work. The rest of the bulbs still work. So you don't throw out the whole strand. Um, so in this case, the, yes, the electricity will pass through the light, but it also has a, another route. You know, it, it can go, let, let's say you have a switch here, you know, the electricity, well, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to light up this bulb, it can just go to the next one. Anyway, um, I couldn't find a drawing of parallel circuits that I was super happy with, but basically, you know the wires not going through the light and back it, it kind of looks like it's still but um, like I can say this wasn't I, I didn't find a drawing I was super happy with but um, in parallel the, the the electricity doesn't have to go through each each resistor uh, it can go around it so multiple circuits um, they, they act independently so just a side note about home wiring and circuits in your house. Um, and I looked at some home wiring diagrams. You, you, you've got a, a, a breaker box, a circuit breaker box, someplace in your house. And think about the word, circuit breaker. It breaks the circuit. It opens the circuit. Um, why would it do that? You know, if, if all the power's off in one room of your house, it, you, you go to the breaker box, and you see which which breaker got tripped. Basically, you know, your house might be wired. It, let's look at this blue line here. Goes to this room, and it's got a couple of outlets. It's got an overhead light. It's got another overhead light. Um, that can probably, you know, that's that's not overloaded. But let's say you added an extension cord here with and you plug 10 different things in and you turned all of them on at once you could overload this circuit you're basically you know you can draw, try drawing enough power through that wire um, that the wire can't really handle that amperage that you know too much power coming through at once it will get hot and it could start a fire in your you know in your attic or something so to prevent that from happening you have a, a breaker in this box here, a circuit breaker. And it might be a 15 amp breaker, it might be a 20 amp breaker, it might be a 30 amp breaker. It depends on how, you know, what circuit uh, and how it was set up. But let's say it's a 20 amp breaker. If you start drawing, you know, let's, so, so the wire could handle 25 amps, but when you get to 20 amps, think it flips the switch. It turns off that circuit. So it's, a, it's just a safety feature. Uh, we used to use fuses and the fuse would just literally burn at a certain amperage uh, to save you from your house fire. And now we use circuit breakers and you can just flip them back. And if you're, if you're tripping the breaker frequently in a certain room, well, you've, just, you've got too much stuff there. 
you know, you've overloaded that circuit. It needs another, you know, you need another set of wires going to that room. Uh, so here's what it looks like when you open up the breaker box. And you can look, there There will be numbers on these telling you how many amps each circuit is. And some of them are big for, you know, your stove or something that has 240 volts going to it. Or, uh, you know, so you might see th two things together or some of them are smaller. Uh, and you can map out it this person's written what the things are for you can just take some time to you know you flip it off and you see what doesn't work anymore and you flip it back on you flip it off and on off and on and you can see you know which room of the house that goes to and you can write it down it's pretty helpful to to map out uh, the, the circuits for your house the wires that go through your attic and go to all these circuits it's called a Romex wire uh, it's got three wires in it, uh, basic, they call it a hot and a cold and a neutral or something like that, a positive, a negative, and a neutral. Uh, the neutral is the ground, and if you look at a, an outlet with three prongs, the bottom hole is the ground. It's going to be attached to this. Um, this is a protection device. Basically, if you get a short circuit in, in your uh, device, um, well, Anyway, I'm not going to go into more of this. My dad's an electrician. Doesn't mean that I understand it. Uh, so, but each light or each plug that you hook up will have all three of these wires attached to it and on both sides. Um, as part of the wiring in series, or uh, sorry, in parallel. Everything in your house should be wired in parallel, not series. Um, here, I, I told you I wasn't happy with the picture I found. Here's another example with switches. So here's the voltage source, switch one, switch two, switch three. So we have three switches. They all need to be closed in order for the bell to sound. Ding, 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 ding. So you need all of them closed to complete the circuit uh, because they're wired in series. Here is three switches, but wired in parallel and you can see the difference. Any switch that's closed and the alarm will sound. So this could be a light bulb instead of an alarm bell, but uh, this is how your house is wired. So any switch that's closed allows electrons to flow through to that device. Um, so here we have three switches for one object. That's a little unusual. Uh, you don't usually have three switches for one light bulb, um, but, but you do have a switch you know, for one device and another switch for another device, another switch for another device. And in parallel, you close any switch and the circuit's complete. The circuit can provide power to that thing. Okay, now let's go to the relationship between magnetism and electricity. Electricity produces magnet magnetism, magnets produce electricity. Uh, so this is kind of weird. But as current flows through a wire, um, there are magnetic fields so lines around that wire and there's this right hand rule business so if the current's going this way you stick your thumb that way and the, the fingers go the direction of these magnetic lines these magnetic field lines so the magnetic field lines uh, are always there around any wire that has current flowing through it um, and so you can test this, you know, just have an extension cord plugged in with, you know, a current flowing through it and bring a compass to it and you'll see that the compass will react to the wire. Um, it will pick up on this magnetic field. It's fairly weak. You can strengthen it by looping the wire. And, and, and so then by having many loops of wire, uh, you're going to have a stronger magnetic field. And if you put something like a an iron nail uh, if you put something mag magnetic well this isn't a magnet right the nail is not a magnet by itself but if you wrap the wire around the nail you have a much stronger magnet okay so this magnetic material this iron nail plus the the copper wire wrapped around it now you have a homemade electromagnet and it's pretty cool um, with your little homemade electromagnet, here's another example. This doesn't have to be a nail, it could be a screw. Um, your homemade electromagnet, you know, all you have to do is touch the two ends to the battery and your magnet is on. It's working and 
and you can pick stuff up with it. Um, this is a big electromagnet, and you can see coils of uh, copper and um, big electromagnets can be quite useful. Yeah, and you can pick up cars with them, and and uh, you can turn them on and off. You can increase or decrease the strength just by changing the voltage, and you can change the polarity, and and uh, that can be useful at times. So electromagnets definitely have some advantages. There are electromagnets in all of your electronic devices for one purpose or another. Uh, magnetism also produces electricity, or at least if a coil of wire passes through a magnetic field. So uh, here in the shake flashlight, we've got coils of wire, and we have a magnet, and if we shake, then we're getting the coils passing through the magnetic field. And as we do that, we are creating electricity. Uh, hydroelectric plants, coal-powered plants, nuclear-powered plants, solar plants. No, not solar. Solar's different. Uh, solar's photo photoelectric, but uh, wind power, um, car alternators, all these things make electricity by moving a coil spinning through a magnetic field. Um, so here's a lake. This is called penstock coming into a turbine. Basically, the water makes this thing spin like crazy before it goes out into the river. Spinning this rod like crazy causes this to spin, which is massive coils of copper inside great big magnets. So great big magnets around it, and as the as the wires spin, it generates electricity. Um, so here's coiled wire cylinder within a magnetic field. It's going to produce electricity. In this case, uh, this is steam coming in and driving this turbine. Steam is what we make with coal. You know, coal the coal-fired power plant, all we're doing is heating up water. That's all we're doing, heating up water. Um, and the steam is directed to drive the turbine. So basically, if you can make something spin, you can generate electricity. Here are some massive turbines. Here's a person, for size reference, down there. Uh, and this is inside of a dam, right? So you go inside of a dam, and they have these massive turbines. The water turns them, which causes the shaft, the whole shaft to turn. And here's the rotor with the big coils of copper. The stator's the magnetic part, I think. Anyway, the it's coils of wire passing through a magnetic field generate electricity. Okay, I'm going to stop there. This has been a one-hour presentation, hopefully helpful. Uh, sorry it's so lengthy. I don't know how to cover it any faster though. And uh, I apologize for all the background noise. I won't do, I won't try. I thought it would be all peaceful and, you know, birds chirping in the background. So much for that idea. Talk to you again.